And welcome to Video Game Hangover. I'm Randy Dickinson, and I'm in, well, I, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh. Taking the show on the road, DJ. All right. Well, nobody invited me to Pittsburgh. <laughs> in yep. any case, I'm DJ Ross. I am still here in Mountain View, California. It's fine. I don't need to go to Pittsburgh. No. You'd be all jet laggy. You'd be half asleep anyways. It's, yeah. I don't want to fly to the East Coast. It's you're better terrible. off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, each week here, nothing on... against the East Coast, other than the fact that it's far from where I am. It's far, and it's really hot right now. And yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe something is against the East Coast. <laughs> I mean, this, yeah, just those two. Really, everything else is fine. Yeah. Each week here on Video Game Hangover, we talk about the games that have been keeping us up at night. This week is the first week of our summer backlog attack. And we are tearing into Bayonetta 2 and Cave Story 3D. Ooh. Next week will be Bayonetta 3 and Cave Story 2D. <laughs> that, that, would be, that would be impressive. That's also yeah. probably, uh, probably a little too much Cave Story for me. Too much Cave Story? Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. How is this going to go? <laughs> it's fine. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to Cave Story, but like, you know, I assume... The 2D and the 3D versions of Cave Story are not super dissimilar, except for the additional dimension. Oh, I see. I was going to say, uh, wouldn't Cave Story 2D be less Cave Story than you're currently experiencing? This, you're, you're probably right. Think correct. about that one. Yeah. <laughs> like, right, let's pause here while I think about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you should put, like, drop in some elevator music. Do, 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 do. So, so how's it going? What are you doing? What's uh, what's up? What's going on on the West Coast? Oh, everything's fine. I don't know what's going on on the West Coast. Why would you ask me that? No? You don't speak on behalf of the West Coast? No, no. I just leave it up to everybody else. Good. That's okay. That's a good policy. <laughs> don't like to <laughs> overstep my bounds yeah. in terms of uh, representing the West Coast. You stay in your lane. Exactly. As we've established, I just presume everybody on the West Coast is surfing all the time, so. Yeah, well, you know, just rushed back from the beach in order to record the show, so. Yeah. Still a little, you know, salt swept or whatever. <laughs> do, do you have a, a and I'm for sort of rewinding back a few weeks, but I'm going to re- reference this a little further. Do you have a mental image a, 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 as someone who's grown up on the West Coast of what, like, people on the East Coast are like? Or people in New England or people in New York or... Oh, you know, they're all like taxi drivers or whatever, right? <laughs> Eating pizza and saying, That's forget about it. just New York. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, other than the stereotypes, nothing specific. Yeah. I do really love that um, Paul F. Tompkins routine about how people in New York <laughs> cannot believe that they're somewhere other than New York uh, <laughs> at any given moment. Uh, that's really good. <laughs> that has since it. become my new visual of a New Yorker, so yeah. I'll put that in the show notes. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, I don't know that bit. I'll have to look it up. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. He dumps on uh, the West Coast as well, so it's, you know, equal opportunity. Fair game. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, but no, no, I don't really, don't really perpetuate any East Coast stereotypes. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if I could confirm or deny anything for you, but you're fairly well-traveled. <laughs> I'm sure you know. I've been to the East Coast a few times. Yeah, yeah. not not for a while, but uh, it's more or less what I expected. Yeah. I mean, nobody's been anywhere for a little while. Right, yeah. The ocean's on the other side over there. <laughs> you know that? That's weird. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been in it a few times. Yeah. I mean, very briefly. Something brushes against my leg, and I'm like, nope, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, what's in there? I've had it. Yeah. I keep, like, you know, the Google alerts this summer are very heavy on shark attacks on the East Coast. 
Um, no, yeah, really? I guess the weather's all screwed up and, and you know, fishing and cold weather currents and things like that. So, yeah, there are places like Jones Beach, New York, where I've been. I've been in that water. I've seen concerts at the Jones Beach Amphitheater. Um, and like two weeks ago, they had to shut the whole beach down because there were shark sightings. Um, yeah. And there had never been that there before or something crazy like that. I'm like, the sharks are coming to New York. Why are people so scared of sharks? Like, you're so less likely to get eaten by a shark than you are to get um, some kind of, like, infectious respiratory disease. <laughs> and people don't seem to have any problem with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure there were shark people, mask when you go yeah, out to the beach. Getting ushered off of the beach were like, no, nah, it's just a cold. Yeah. Yeah. Just a cold, like a... <laughs> Half their leg is missing. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> I woke up this morning. I thought we were in America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm not a big like you know. The beach going for me is generally sort of wrapping myself in in sunblock and and linens and an umbrella and trying to read on my Kindle while my dogs play in the sand and Sarah goes in the ocean and I, you know, I'm just repulsed by both of those things. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, every every now and then I've waded in, and yeah, I've seen enough horror movies to know that sharks are terrifying. You're not going to get eaten by a shark. Not eaten, but like snacked on. Well, I mean, I'm just including it, all those things a shark would do to you in, into that one category. <laughs> that one thing, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to be partially eaten by a shark? No. All right, well, I'll take that thought with me the next time I go to the beach. Okay, good. Yeah. Trying to get you to overcome this fear of, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's legitimate to be terrified of sharks, though. They are just prehistoric murder machines. Yes, yeah. Strange underwater aliens with a lot of teeth. Yeah, yeah. It's weird that they are just uh, things that exist in real life. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I don't have a segue for there. I'm like, you know what else is a weird thing that exists in real life? <laughs> the summer backlog attack. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's going. It's here. It is. We are in it. We are in the throes of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, DJ, what is the Summer Backlog Attack for, um, you know, for the listeners who maybe don't know or haven't sort of, uh, uh, you know, people tend to sample. They tend to skip around episodes sometimes. Yeah. Maybe they don't listen to everything. What for is this thing we're doing? people who weren't aware that it exists. Yeah. What, what is it? What it is, is uh, it's a few weeks at the end of the summer where Randy and I dive into our backlog of unfinished uh, slash unplayed games, and we pick out a few that we want to complete. Maybe it's because uh, we've just never gotten around to playing them. We've always wanted to. Maybe it's they're just been, they've just been collecting dust on our shelf for too long. There's a whole bunch of criteria <laughs> that uh, can bring a game into the backlog attack. But uh, we try to spend a few weeks knocking them out, and then we talk about them on here. Yeah, and it's usually a lot of fun because we end up playing a bunch of just really weird stuff. Um, and every year we also challenge listeners to play along, um, and that includes you, you the person listening to this. If if you'd like to play along and try and knock out four games from your backlog this summer, um, we would love for you to do that. You can get more information on how to join in and sort of submit your list to us via um, what are we having them do this year? You can do it via Twitter. Yep. Twitter.com slash VG Hangover. They can go to the website, which is, I'm pretty sure it's back at this point. Yes. Back and functional at VGHangover.com. There's a post right up at the top. And while you're on the website, you can get a link to our Discord where we have a backlog attack channel. And you can just drop your list in there. Man, the channel is really like, uh, <laughs> People are getting weird with the backlogs this year, which is exciting. <laughs> it's nice to see some sort of robust backlog chat. But uh, yeah, we as we are wont to do on our Discord, we tend to stray sometimes. Yeah, I yeah. like it, though. People are getting super unconventional. Yeah. I think one of uh, <laughs> one of the, the people in there was saying that part of their backlog is just, was it like installing custom firmware on their Vita or something? Yes. Yeah. Yep. It's like, oh, oh okay, sure. That's <laughs> fine. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, the, the the concept of a backlog is not isolated to just video games. I certainly, I have a movie backlog. I have a, um, I don't have a music backlog. I'm pretty much up to date on the music I want to listen to. I definitely have a book backlog. Every time I turn on my, my Kindle, I'm like, oh, I should really read all of these books someday. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, there, we we have um, members of our community in the in the backlog channel who who, who are behind on what were some of the things model airplanes and manga. I think were some of the things that oh, yeah, came up. Yeah. yeah. So you know anything you fall behind on life that, that you want to use the summer to catch up on, that's great, and we would love to chat with you about it. Our thing is video games. Right. Well, so here's the thing. I never even thought about extending the backlog attack beyond video games. But now that this is apparently a thing, I'm just like, oh, why not? I mean, it's a little weird because we're already a week into it. But if if that's what people want to do. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're very go with the flow here at Video Game Hangover. Yeah. The backlog attack, as I mean, this is maybe the most formal thing we do all year. It's still very informal. So uh, who knows? Go nuts with your backlog list this year. Yeah. It's never too late to make a last minute addition or a substitution <laughs> or whatever. Sure. Just uh, just let us know about it if you want to be a part of the contest. Excellent. Um, why would you want to be a part of the contest, though? You ask. Uh, DJ, why would you like to be a part of the contest? Well, I have a very good reason why you'd want to do that. Uh, which is at the end of the contest, which will be, I think, September 12th, we decided uh, we will crown the winner of the greatest feat of backloggery, which who knows what that means at this point. (laughs) But if it's you, you will win the uh, new release video game of your choice. Yeah. So that's very exciting. And I think (laughs) despite all these other developments, we're probably going to keep that as the prize. The prize is going to stay a video game. We don't want to have to buy somebody fair. a new like motorcycle or surfboard or whatever. <laughs> right. To be careful what we commit ourselves to, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. staying grounded in, in that area. Excellent. But anyway, that's very exciting. That could be you. Yeah. So all you need to do is just go to vghangover.com, read that show post on how to enter, and just keep us updated. And we require proof. We're not just going to take your word for it. We, we, to a certain degree, we want kind of, you know, uh, 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 documentation of your progress through your backlog. Uh, last week, we were just challenging people to sort of post up their lists. Um, so if you head over to our Discord, you can certainly see a, a, a pretty good representation of some of the games that folks are working on this summer. Uh, what is our challenge for week two, DJ? Oh, the challenge this week is, again, very video game oriented. But who knows what you can do with this. We just want you to take a screenshot of whatever you're playing this week and post it to us via the Discord or on Twitter. You can email it to us at VG Hangover. (laughs) What's our email address? Contact at VGHangover.com. There you go. Any one of those will work. Just make sure to tag us if you're uh, you know, on Twitter or whatever. Right. Um, Uh, And that's it. That'll get you some nice bonus points towards uh, walking away with that new game. Screenshots are easy. That's that's fairly low stakes. Yeah, when we started this, consoles didn't even have their own built-in screenshot button, <laughs> so it's become much easier. When I was your age, we yeah. didn't have screenshots. Yeah, you had to make an oil painting or whatever you were <laughs> right, playing. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And if you push pause for too long, the console would overheat and melt you on your Ooh. television set. And yeah. 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 Terrible. It would burn into your television screen forever. <laughs> yeah, the, the last screenshot you'll ever take. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, so this week we are, um, uh, this is our first week, so uh, I played uh, Cave Story 3D. Um, it's um, it's fine. Was it, is it all you hoped and dreamed it would be? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I honestly, I don't know how I even ended up having this. So I'm playing it on the 3DS. Uh, it's been fun to have an excuse to play uh, my 3DS again. Um, mm-hmm. uh, not that I need, yeah, I guess I do need excuses. I was just saying, not that I need an excuse, but uh, I, I've not touched it in months. So here's my excuse. Um, and uh, I, I've had this copy of Cave Story 3D, and I, I've been going through kind of old video games and trying to clean out my collection and clean off my shelves, and I've got games all over the house, and I don't know what to do with physical media anymore. Most people don't want it. Um, I, I have shelves really? full of, like, CDs and, and DVDs that I can't give away. Um, okay, know. well, like, CDs and DVDs are one thing, but, I mean, depending on what video games you've got, it seems like there's always... Uh some generation of video games, the second hand market is booming. Just on fire, yeah. So it certainly seems like kind of the 3DS and DS era of Nintendo games has, is sort of in that, well, and just sort of coming out of that moment, right? I think it was kind of huge during the early days of the pandemic as people were, uh, okay. you know, trying to use their downtime to catch up on video games and looking for anything to kind of entertain them and, and um, 
Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not a sort of biographer of these things. I don't chart the rise and fall of video game values. Um, but I was a little blown away by what Cave Story 3D was kind of going for on the internet when I did a quick search. And I was oh. like, oh, well, maybe I'll just play it and try to sell it and make some money <laughs> off of it. Um, uh, so, yeah, I have this physical copy of this thing that I played on my 3DS. Um Cave Story is kind of an interesting uh, like case study in like the history of indie gaming, I feel like, is that it, I think the original oh, version yeah. of this came out in 2004. Um, uh, it was, if I understand the, sort of the story correctly, it was a PC game. And then ultimately it became kind of one of the first kind of DSiWare and WiiWare games that you could kind of download from Nintendo very on in the early days of their service. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I missed all of that. <laughs> it was, uh, I was not necessarily sort of consuming games like that in that way at that time. Um, but when this 3D version of it came out for the, uh, for the 3DS in 2011, geez, like seven years later, um, kind of popped onto my radar. It looked cool. I, I've always liked platformers. It looks a bit like a, th- you know, a 3D kind of mascot platformer. Um, although I've heard kind of over the years that it's a little more story driven. It's got some kind of interesting kind of characterization and stuff like that. And, yeah. Um, yeah, but just so, so just to be clear, it's called Cave Story 3D, but it is it's very much a 2D platformer, right? It's just 3D because it's on the 3DS. Correct. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and it, it is a sort of a full remake of the original kind of Cave Story 2D, um, uh, done with sort of 3D environments and things like that for um, for the 3DS. Um, mm-hmm. The irony is that uh, I can't really. <laughs> I can't deal with looking at the 3DS screen anymore. So um, <laughs> I've been playing Cave Story 3D and 2D. Um, yeah. 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 But I mean, it's, it's not, not like an, just, oh, just to clarify, because I'm getting confused. Okay. It's not like 3D, like 3D environments. You're moving around in 3D. It's just using the 3D effect of the 3DS. Correct. Yeah. Um, Got it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the 2D version of it was was pretty flat. It looks like an old Nintendo game um, yeah. by, by design. Yeah. And this new one very much, you know, it has <laughs> sort of a depth of field to it that goes beyond sort of the 3D effect of the 3DS. It is, okay. um, yeah, the 3D models and, and stuff like that. But you really, only, you only move left or right. You're not moving. It's not an open world game. You're not, you know, it's not like a Super Mario 3D or something like that. It's, mm-hmm. yeah, I guess that is sort of confusing unless you have a visual in mind of what this thing looks like. Yeah. I played this on Switch, I think. So very much still 2D. I think it may have gotten like an HD sort of graphical touch up. But, um, you know, definitely, you know, it didn't have a 3D effect, of course. Yeah. But uh, still very much just a, I feel like it was very uh, authentic to the original. When you fire it up on the 3DS, you have three options for like what game mode you want to play. And there's a story mode, a classic mode. And a question mark, question mark, question mark that you're locked Ooh. out of, I presume, until you finish one or both of the other ones. Um, I, uh, I've i only played the story mode. I don't know what the other two do. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, I mean, I think to call it, call it a story mode is generous. <laughs> it's pretty slight. Um, you don't get a ton of, uh, of direction or backstory. Uh, I, I think similar to sort of a Mario, you know, if, if you were new to the, to the planet of earth and you had never played a mario game before um and we're sort of dropped into playing pick any mario game i think you'd be a little confused by what's going on right it's um yeah yeah why, why is that mushroom walking towards me correct yeah um so there's a, a lot of sort of weirdness like that in um in Cave Story, it just doesn't have sort of the benefit of being kind of a pop culture juggernaut created by Nintendo behind it. Um, mm-hmm. And having sort of this sort of shorthand familiarity of what all these things are. Um, so yeah, there's, there's stuff about an evil scientist and he's abducting sort of like anthropomorphic rabbits. <laughs> Whew. There, and there's a weird case of mistaken identity, and somebody gets taken by the evil doctor who is not the person that they were supposed to take. And the evil doctor has a henchman named Igor who is a giant evil anthropomorphic rabbit. Um, <laughs> and there's also a TV that kind of looks like a toaster that can fly that comes after you, and his name is Balrog. Um, oh, I don't remember that guy. Yeah, there's... um. Well, I remember, like, I sort of remember what that character looks like, but it's been a while since I played this. I... I vaguely recall the story being um, more convoluted than I expected. 
<laughs> not like con- maybe not convoluted because that sounds like that sounds negative, but just more intricate than I was expecting. It's just bizarre, and a lot of it is sort of contextless. Like you- that's a little bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you are apparently a soldier from the surface, but none of the sort of proceedings in the game take place in the surface. And and you just sort of start by falling into the cave that the cave story takes place in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. It's just, it, it's very bizarre and you don't get a lot of sort of like hows and whys behind it. Um, it has a very sort of odd logic to it too sometimes where, you know, there's little puzzles you have to solve all while trying to sort of platform around some fairly dangerous environments uh, mm-hmm. and very aggressive enemies. Um, and, uh, uh, like, the solution to them is not sort of a, obvious in any kind of, I don't know, rational way that you would come to a conclusion <laughs> about how things work in a video game. It feels very much like an old Silent Hill kind of thing, like an adventure game kind of thing where you just go through everything in your inventory and go, how about this? How about this combined with this? Does any of this work for you? Um, so there is a weird, you know, uh, unexpected in, uh, you know, quasi unrealistic logic behind the way that things sort of like operate together and solve puzzles for you. Mm-hmm. There's something kind of midway through the game where a door is like jammed shut. And you run around for no lie, like an hour and a half trying to like try anything and everything you can possibly find in the environment and then combine them together. And there's a crack in the wall where a guy feeds you hints very slowly. Um, (laughs) And it's a lot of like backtracking and hopping over. And anytime you walk into a door and then walk out of a door again, all the enemies that you killed respawn. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, uh, uh, it's it's a lot, man. (laughs) It's an oddly punishing experience um uh yeah i, I don't back no. from uh, what you said 2004 yeah yeah i mean it doesn't sound too out of character from other games coming out at the time yeah it gets um sort of progressively you get progressively stronger and better obviously you get better weapons as time goes by the weapons level up it has a really kind of unique way of handling sort of leveling up for weapons that every time you kill an enemy with a uh, with a, a particular weapon, it drops little kind of triangles that bounce around on the screen. And every time you pick one of those, it's like one XP for that weapon. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you collect enough of them, you get to like level one of that weapon, level two, level three. Um, the thing that's kind of uh, uh, fun and pretty unique about it is that as you take damage with that weapon in your hand, you lose some of that XP. <laughs> so if you're running around with your level three rocket launcher and then you take a bunch of damage while you have that in your hand, it'll downgrade you to a level two and then ultimately to a level one until you can Ooh. use it enough to get it back up to a level three. And I was like, oh, I don't think I've seen the game actually sort of downgrade your weapons before (laughs) it makes you really want to try real hard to kind of hold on to it and keep them at level three where they're really good and really effective and you have a ton of ammo um so yeah i I don't know i I thought that was kind of an interesting sort of design choice that i've not seen replicated in other games Hmm. you should play uh (laughs) ghosts and goblins when you have a chance is that a thing yeah oh yeah well i mean that that game is like just brutally punishing but uh it's another game I could think of off the top of my head. Uh, mm-hmm. I was just watching somebody play it over the weekend, and I was like, oh, yeah, games used to be quite difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to play Legend of Zelda for next week, so I, I will have things to say about that, I'm oh. sure. <laughs> but uh, I don't want to spend my entire, entire summer backlog just complaining about how difficult old games used to be. But, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so uh, Cave Story 3D um, is a... Uh, it's kind of a weird game. It's it's and I and I keep sort of putting myself in the mindset again that if if you if you played a Mario game with zero context and zero sort of pop culture, you know, knowledge of it, no nostalgia at all, that you would be confused as well. Like you said, why is this why is this mushroom talking? Why is there a a, a, a princess who lives in a kingdom full of mushroom people and she's dating a plumber? Like there's enough sort of odd kind of nonsensical things to it that we all accept accept as human beings who have grown up in a world where nintendo is a thing mm-hmm. um so it's i i i you know i admire <laughs> the developer or creator of of cave story who i've heard is kind of a, a sort of a single person the original game anyways a single person development team oh yeah um, yeah and uh for just having sort of a weird kind of uh, fever dream vision of what his 
platformer was going to look like. Um, yeah, there's a lot of bizarro stuff in this, and 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 I've sort of barely scratched the surface with some of it. There's a whole sequence where the evil scientist has these giant eggs, and <laughs> there's like a weird electrical security guard thing and enemies everywhere and you're trying to power on machines and you have to find the key to the power room and you can go inside some of the eggs and there's computers in them. It, again, super bizarre um, with no sort of context kind of giving you any sort of insight on why it is that way. So you just go with it. Just kind of have fun. You try to shoot the things. You try to stay alive. The more yeah. you play, the kind of better you get. You pick up XP pretty uh, quickly for uh, to, for your character, not just be your weapons, but you pick up little heart containers and stuff like that. And while well, you start the game with like two hearts and no weapons and no defenses whatsoever, so you're pretty fragile for the first few minutes. Um, uh, that levels up pretty quickly, and and before you get more than an hour or so into it, you're you know you've got 25 hearts and. A couple yeah. of big guns leveled up, and you can kind of hold your own. But it, it is it, if you screw up, it's a hundred percent failure. There's you don't take little. <laughs> there's there's a couple of like insta kill things that happen in the game that if you you know if you're a little sloppy about your platforming, if you overrun a, a landing a little bit, if you you know don't quite stick a jump, uh, you know then it'll knock a hundred and twenty five hearts off of you. It'll wipe you out in a second, and you know back to where you last saved. So hopefully you remembered <laughs> to save when you saw the little heart console and the last egg that had a computer in it. Yeah. I remember the opening, I don't know how long it lasted, like especially the first few rooms being particularly difficult. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when did I play this? Probably, I don't know, within the last like five years or so. It took a little sort of mental readjustment to... Just get back into it and be like, oh, right. So I should be paying more attention than I am used to yeah. uh, playing other games. <laughs> I had, um, when I put this cart in my 3DS, I found that I had uh, uh, a save on it for my first attempt to play it. Um, oh. And the date on it was 2013. So it's been nine years since I last attempted to play this video game. Oh, um, wow. You probably and- played this before I did. Oh. Um, and I played it at that time. I played it for like 32 minutes before giving up on it. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm proud to say that I've stuck with, geez, I think I'm super close to the end. I've not seen credits roll yet, but uh, er- everything I'm doing feels very much like a final act. Um, oh. I've read on the internet that it has a couple of different endings and stuff like that. So I, we'll see how that stuff goes. But I, I, uh, I've gotten much further than I did nine years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm proud of that. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest friction is just getting through that first probably 45 minutes where you're basically running around empty handed, but there's still quite a few enemies. Yeah, um, just getting over that mental hurdle almost. Yeah, yeah. Of Like I want to kill everything. I, I see I want to dispatch everything. This game does not have that thing that sort of Mario platformers do where you can kind of bounce on anim- enemies' heads to take them out. Mm-hmm. Um, as I quickly learned the first time I <laughs> sort of replayed it, I was like, oh, no, that just kills me. You can't do that <laughs> anymore. Um, yeah. So, again, I have to sort of undo all of the Mario programming I have in my head to want to, like, bop little ground enemies on the head. Um but yeah, I mean, for the most part, at every point later in the game, you have no less than three or four guns on you. So, okay, that's yeah, that's helpful. Yes, absolutely. Um, Are there like difficult bosses in this? I'm trying to remember because it's been a while since I played this. I think I'm getting it confused with um, this guy's other game, Caro Blaster, which um, oh. I feel like that was much more action oriented than this. There are some bosses in this. Yeah. <laughs> the funny and, and how's that? Um, they're okay. They're they're um very pattern based. So again, like all of my Mario training has brought me to this to this moment. Uh, Zelda, well, some of my Zelda training, where you know everything comes in attacks of three. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And things are basically sort of don't get close because if you get close, they have like you know some like quick punch or something like that that gets you. So <laughs> they'll hop three times and I'll back up. It doesn't have a thing where you can sort of walk backwards and shoot. So it's a lot of like. Walk a little, shoot backwards. Walk a little, shoot backwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But uh, manageable. I, I don't live in sort of perpetual fear of them. Um, it did a fun thing the first time you see... The first time you see sort of a big intimidating boss, it comes sort of 
busting through a wall. It's the flying television toaster thing I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says uh, something along the lines of like, uh, uh, oh, you've, I'm very upset with you right now. Uh, um, I, I think I'm going to, you know, I think I'm going to destroy you. And you get like a little prompt that says, uh, okay, or no, not right now. Uh, <laughs> and as a lark, I sort of selected, no, not right now. Let's find out what happens. And he goes away. He just leaves you alone. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, until later. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I was like, oh, what if I had said yes? Would I have had a boss battle or did he, does he leave anyways? Uh, so yeah, it's unique. It does uh, odd and unexpected things sometimes. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think it could very well be a thing where I'm like, I know what this is. I get this. I, you know. I'm a, I'm a professional gamer. I know how games like this work. So, but it, yeah, it, it, yeah. it continues to sort of defy expectations in a lot of ways. That's cool. I mean, on some level, 2004 sounds fairly late into just, you know, the grand timeline of video game development. But even then, it, like compared to now, especially, it feels like games are so much less templated back then. And uh, <laughs> there's just so, they go off in so many more strange directions than uh, you would expect them to these days. Sure. Um, so yeah, it's, an, you know, w- w- would I recommend it? That was the thing I was sort of thinking. I was like, could I, could I, could I in, in, in uh, um, you know, as a self-respecting video game podcast host, tell other people that you really need to play Cave Story? Um, I don't know. It's, it, it is, <laughs> it's, it's a little hard to get into. It's a little obtuse to play through. It can be a little punishing at times. Um, I don't know. I feel a little badass that I've kind of survived it and kind of hung with it for a while. So it does feel like something of an accomplishment. Um, but I think it's kind of the most interesting thing about it is that it's this pretty unique piece of like indie gaming history. Like, you know, yeah, two, 2004 yeah. is the very early days of what we all sort of generally expect you know, the Nintendo eShop and Steam and stuff like that to kind of look like at this point. Um, this predates, you know, all of your Shovel Knights and, and everything else that has sort of since come that kind of apes this aesthetic. So it it is really, and it's Metroidvania. That's another thing, like, you know, when Metroid and Castlevania were the only games that really were built like this, mm-hmm. there was this cave story that came out, which was kind of, uh, you know, before we, I think maybe we even had a, a, a way of sort of describing how this structure of a video game works. Um, so, yeah, I think, it, you know, it, it's unique because it's the first of a lot of things that maybe we take for granted as gamers in 2022. Yeah, yeah. I remember, like, I don't think I loved this when I went back and played it, but it is really interesting to just look at through that kind of lens where it's like, oh, so it's just this one guy made this, and suddenly it was on all these different platforms, and they released it on online, like on PC and everything. And yeah, I know it's not, like, the very first indie game, because people were making, like, shareware stuff and sending sure. all those things around forever. But I think it's it's seen as sort of like the first indie game, like the first widely distributed sort of a like console indie game, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, so it's an interesting, just a, a cool sort of point in history, like you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't know what else sort of was available on on DSiWare or WiiWare in two thousand four yeah. or two thousand five at that point, or. Um, you know, did you have a DSi? I had a DSi, yeah. I eventually oh. did, yeah. I don't know that I used it for a hell of a lot, though. I missed out on that. I don't think uh, I went from whatever DS Lite to I mean, it would have been 3DS would be the next one. So I, the next I'm step, not yeah. even sure what was on that weird sort of uh, DSi wear shop. Yeah, I have a vague memory of the first um, one of the first Steam World games being like a tower defense game that came out and seeing that in the little. Nintendo shop at the time, but I don't know how much of that stuff has sort of like is still accessible. Even Nintendo's very good at kind of walling mm-hmm, those mm-hmm. things off and shutting those services down, and those games disappear forever. So I guess I guess a bit of a victory for Cave Story that it sort of continues to sort of live on and in, in, in other ways and be accessible in other ways. Yeah, uh, man. Well, that's cool that you're sticking with it. I was um, again. I might be just thinking of Caro Blaster, but. I remember running into some bosses at some point where I just thought, well, this is, <laughs> I mean, clearly this is from an earlier era where you could just make a boss battle that you expect people to have to come back to over and over again because they just can't, like, can't take them out right away. Yeah. 
So when you mentioned you were playing this, I just thought, ooh, uh, I wonder how this is going to go. It could be a very <laughs> short episode. <laughs> yeah, they don't. Um, they're they're not too bad. Once you sort of figure out the pattern, and, and uh, it's a little, it's a little claustrophobic. So you're you're kind of stuck in a room with these guys a lot. Um, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, sometimes it feels like this. You know, there are attacks and there are um, projectiles and stuff like that. You can't really sort of rightfully evade or avoid i want a crouch button sometimes and things like that um mm-hmm. or i want a shield but <laughs> there's nothing like that in this game it's you know if, you, if you're going to take it you're going to take take the shot kind of full force in the face and then hopefully you have enough hearts to soak it up um the game is also pretty generous about kind of dropping little power-ups and little hearts and extra missile tanks and stuff like that so um you know as you're sort of knocking out the little scrubs and stuff like that that come you generally can get enough little hearts to kind of keep yourself topped up and keep yourself in the game so um hmm. i've not found it incredibly punishing it's the surprise things that pop up it's the i think i know a level pretty well and then i i, I futz a jump and land in a pile of spikes and i have to restart from 15 <laughs> minutes back um, uh, okay yeah so it's um yeah, I, early on, that was what kind of one of my biggest complaints is, one, this is surprisingly difficult, but it's just, I, I didn't have much health. Um, and two, the platforming feels very slippery slippery for something that is sort of like, uh-huh. there's a lot of moments in it where it requires sort of very precise sort of landing on a on a little one one cube thing floating in the sky. Um, uh, I tend to overrun things a lot. I tend to sort of land on it and then take an extra two, three steps <laughs> and just fall off the side of it into a bottomless pit of spikes so um i had to sort of like you know get good before i could sort of proceed uh and just try to be a little more precise about me landing and again just trying to sort of uh, unlearn maybe bad habits i've I've picked up from modern platformers Hmm. Hmm. well i'm impressed sticking with it um Makes me think maybe I should go back and play this because what you're describing sounds so different than how I'm remembering it. Oh, interesting. Um, maybe I just didn't spend enough time with it. Yeah, hmm. I, I, I'm assuming that Cave Story 3D is just sort of a 3D version of Cave of Cave Story, but I, I don't know how much you know e- expansion was done, how much additional stuff was done. I, I'm, I'm I imagine they probably had an opportunity to tweak and refine and expand if they wanted to, but. And I'm not sure yeah. who they, they is in this scenario. I, I, you know, I know the original Cave Story was, like we said, sort of a single developer. Um, but uh, to do the 3D version, it probably was a small army of people. Uh, it's published by Nicalis, which is, you know, a, a pretty big Japanese video game publisher. So, um, yeah, I don't. I'm not sure what my point is, but I, I figure, like, you know. I assume that they were just sort of one to one, except that this new one looks prettier on the 3DS. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, but maybe they could have touched it in different ways and added stuff to it. I know the Switch version had like a plus mode. I think it was actually called Key Story Plus, um, where you had the option to go back and play something that was much closer to the original. Oh, and of course, I can't remember which one I actually played it on. I think I played the updated version. But I don't know if that was just like a visual overhaul or if they made gameplay tweaks as well. Well, now I'm got to be very curious if I'm remembering <laughs> this game correctly. Go uh, add another one onto my backlog this year. Sorry about that. I mean, no, it's fine. I'm, I don't mind going back and playing Cave Story again. Um, uh, let's see how it is. It's pretty consumable. I think that's another sort of uh, maybe way to sort of couch this too is, is it can't be more than four hours long, so... It's uh, you know, it's a, it's maybe a weekend's investment of time if you play it here and there. Um, even if you score, if you want to get all the endings though, yeah, well, that I can't help you with. That, that might require a little more work and maybe an <laughs> FAQ or something like that. But yeah, mm, yeah. I will admit I've have, I've have consulted Game Facts a few times. I there, there were a couple that puzzle man about how to get the door open with the guy inside. I was like, I don't. I, I think I've done everything I know how to do, and, and it was some bizarre combination of things that would have never occurred to me in any <laughs> reasonable way um, that I'm like, oh, well, thank you, Mr. GameFAQs. I figured it out. Yeah. Well, okay. That's good. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And I fully intend to use a walkthrough for Legend of Zelda because I'm... Oh, come on. Yeah. I mean, it's fine. I'm sure I used a walkthrough to some extent back in the day. Although I was actually trying to remember, I must have had like a book or something, because back then you couldn't just hop on the internet and look stuff up. <laughs> but also, there are a lot of the puzzles and just like finding dungeons in that game uh, is 
very convoluted and obtuse, so yeah, I must have had some sort of assistance. Although that was like that was one of those classic sort of um, situations where I like a bunch of my friends were also playing this, or they like were familiar with it. And we would throw around theories of like, oh man, I, you know, <laughs> do, you, do you talk to the old man by the waterfall yet or whatever? <laughs> like he would throw out some hint and we'd try and uh, figure out what he was getting at. Just uh, kind of a situation you just don't have these days, video games. Yeah, that sort of social aspect, that offline yeah. social aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah, because you like really, you just couldn't look up the answers as easily. Uh, so you really did have to figure stuff out. Yeah. All right, well, uh, uh, tune in next week because I'm Legend of Zelda is next up on my list. So um, yeah. we'll see if I figure it out. I was trying to find, I was trying to remember which like strategy guide or whatever I would have had uh, back in the day and see if they were selling it on Amazon because I was going to try and send it to you. Oh, really? <laughs> but I have, have no idea what it was. They probably don't <laughs> even print it anymore. So we'll, we'll see how you manage. It's probably worth a million dollars at this point. Yeah, I was yeah. I was thinking like, okay, so this is either like they're gonna have a, a hundred copies of this for like five cents each, or it's gonna cost a, a fortune on eBay at this point. <laughs> Who knows? No, GameFAX is there for me when I need it. Right. Yeah. At this point, you know, GameFAX has got you covered. <laughs> there, there was one FAQ that I found for um for Cave Story 3D that was sort of it had like a, a list of like. Uh, why you should use this fact over any other one of the other ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was sort of like voted uh, fact of the month for like oh. September 2015 or something like that. I was like, ooh, fact of the month. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I was, you know, I'm like, this clearly is the one I need to use. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's the one. Yeah. Man. But yeah. I'll put a link to that if anybody wants to, to consult it. It's it's well written. There's some funny little jokes in it and stuff like that. It's you know it's one of those ones. This person is clearly having a good time with what their mm-hmm. their little hobby is. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good. Um, yeah, and it saved me on a couple of occasions and trying to figure out some of these crazy puzzles in Cave Story. Nice. I love that people are still contributing to Game Facts when video games really exploded during the probably 360 PS3 era. And you started getting more wikis and like IGN guides and things like that. I was really worried that, you know, GameFAQs would just become extinct. And it's definitely not as like active as it was back in the, you know, NES, Super NES era, but uh, new facts will still pop up on there pretty regularly. So that's good. I mean, that was, you know, and and I I wasn't the most connected young adult, but that was the forum, right? That was the place that you Mm -hmm. could get, like, little forums about video games and stuff like that. And it wasn't super toxic until later, but, Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yeah. It had its own sort of, like, GameFAQs flavor of toxicity. Yes, yeah. But it was very much sort of the classic video game forum where, like, you know, it was broken up into different things and and different themes and different games. And you could search for, like, is anyone stuck on the old man by the waterfall? And there would be a thread (laughs) about that. And you could, like, you know, get some hints on where you were stuck. So, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, in in the early days of, of, of me looking for help playing video games on the Internet, which has, you know. 25 years later has still not gotten old for me um mm-hmm. uh yeah game facts served a uh, a valuable purpose in life oh yeah my favorite thing back in the day was uh if you just had any question about whatever you were playing no matter how obscure it was you could just go to the game facts forum for that game and start a new thread it was like hey does anybody know what this thing means i can't figure it out and in five minutes, you would just get a response with the right answer. It was uncanny. I was like, who is reading, like, who is monitoring these forums? Yeah. And, like, just with encyclopedic knowledge of these games. It was really incredible. Better and cheaper and faster than the Nintendo Hotline. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> now you have to just, like, dig through a bunch of discords and terrible wikis that are just SEO bombs. It's terrible. <laughs> this is true. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, uh, uh, how's Bayonetta two treating you? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> so, just to to set this up, I, I I probably played Bayonetta one as part of the backlog uh, several years ago because I had never played through that and uh, didn't really enjoy it. 
Just in general, I'm not a huge fan of these sort of character action games like Devil May Cry. What other games fall into this category? I do really enjoy Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, the same developer as Platinum, which I can't really explain. I don't know if it's because, you know, I'm much more a fan of like Metal Gear or the gameplay was just different enough in that game that I would uh, prefer it over Bayonetta. That was one of my previous backlog attack games. <laughs> you game tried to re- play Revengeance? Yeah, a couple of years ago. Ooh. That game was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that was good. It was great. <laughs> but just something about this whole style of game where you, you have like the combos and you know, you're doing all these air juggles and everything, and I feel at some point either they get incredibly technical and like very demanding on you to be like dodging and everything. Oh like Ninja Gaiden was the other game I was trying to think of. Or you just bump the difficulty down to easy mode, and then it becomes trivial. And I just feel like I'm not the type of gamer who can play th- through one of these on, like, ultra export mode and, you know, get the, the triple S ranking on every stage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. It will come as no surprise that I'm not either, but I, I, I like sure. sort of the trivial challenge sure. of playing it on easy. I think okay. baby, baby mode is the way to go, Bayonetta. Uh, the first Bayonetta is, it, it was especially fun for me uh, in that mode. I, I like kind of the modern Dev- Devil May Cry games for that reason, too, playing them on easy and just spamming the hell out of the buttons. I don't oh, remember really? any of the combos, but just going wild and tap, 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 <laughs> really just yeah. trying to stay alive. Uh, and they're absurd. They're just, you know, crazy cutscenes and wacky shit and, you know, she has guns in her shoes and <laughs> yeah <laughs> stuff like that it was just yeah they're fun yeah so i mean with all of this in mind i was like i should give bayonetta 2 a shot give it a second chance just as kind of an attempt to figure out why people are into these if there's something beyond just the you know i'm an unbelievable gamer and i play all of these games on the hardest difficulty because i am just the combo lord or whatever but also, since knowing that I am not the combo lord, <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm just going to go into this, and I'm going to put it on normal, and as soon as it starts to present any sort of like difficulty, I'm just going to drop it down and not feel ashamed of myself. Uh, I'm just going to put it on easy mode. And also, I'm going to be very open-minded about the cutscenes and the storyline, because as you said, it is absurd. <laughs> yep. Uh, and that was just something I got from the first one. I, I was just like is this supposed to be like making sense or are people even into this for the story? I don't really know what to expect. Like it's all very silly. It's it's the the whole storyline is about like, she's a witch and she's a member of this long running, like bloodline of witches and they fight against evil angels for some reason. And I couldn't tell if the, the whoever wrote this was just like, I'm just going to write, the most insane storyline I can think of because it doesn't matter or if they were actually headed somewhere with this like ever since I've been a kid I've <laughs> wanted to write this story about angels fighting witches and yep. this is the place to do it this is you know this is my magnum opus <laughs> and not so, just angels but like sexy bondage angels and yeah just yeah there's definitely a weird like subversive sexual bend to everything yeah and that's, and that's yeah. a whole other layer on top of all of this so it's weird that this has sort of found a home on nintendo consoles which is yeah of course yes yeah. the the console you associate with <laughs> just sexy naked witches right and, yeah like hell demons <laughs> it's funny i was listening to another podcast recently that they had this sort of the big reveal a few weeks ago of bayonetta 3 and the release date coming this fall and sort of eagerly anticipated it's been in the works for quite a while and one of the hosts mm-hmm. was like oh, I, can't, I can't watch any more bayonetta trailers i don't want to ruin the story and I was like, are, are we yeah. playing the same games? I don't. <laughs> yeah, because if you, if I had to sort of like, if you were ready, describe what happens in the first Bayonetta. I yeah, could, just could spoil not. Bayonetta for me. Just <laughs> give me the the plot Please. twist. Just only. Yeah, no clue. And I've seen that. I have seen credits roll on on Bayonetta one, and I could not tell you what happened in that game. Yeah, man, I had to go back. Like, I actually put the controller down at one point and went to the Bayonetta wiki. Because I was just like, okay, I didn't think this was going to be an issue, but I don't remember so, so like the lore behind the, <laughs> the battle between the witches and the angels. And there's like, it's got its own version of heaven and hell. I was like, is this, like, is is heaven bad and hell is good in this? Or they're both kind of bad and bad. They both seem pretty bad. Like, yes, I remember that. I, yeah. So that's just another point of confusion. So anyway, 
open mind playing this on very easy, or at least trying to after the first few levels. And I have to say, I don't know. I still don't know if I get it. <laughs> like, sure, the, I'm just accepting that the story is going to be absurd all the way through. It's still presented in a way that seems very self-serious. And man, there are a lot of cutscenes in this. I don't remember if the first one was quite the story heavy, but I was surprised after the first couple stages. I just felt like there were long stretches where I would just not be doing anything and listening to the characters sort of just set up what they're going to do and you know why they have to get to the the sacred mountain or whatever. And I was like, man, somebody like somewhere out there, somebody is just like drinking all of this up. <laughs> and I, I can't imagine what that's like. And you were not that somebody, yeah. No, I wasn't. No, I I mean, they're very entertaining, but similarly, it's just Nothing seems to make sense from one moment to the next. Like, the opening scene has got them... Have you played Bayonetta 2 or just the first one? Just the first one. I've not played the second one, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Hopefully I'm not spoiling anything here. (laughs) But she's, like, out shopping, and then they get attacked by, I guess, the angels. But then there's, like, a fighter jet. I don't know why there's a fighter jet, but the, (laughs) the fighter jet factors into this quite a few times, as it turns out. It just seems like, uh, it, on some level, it's just an excuse for them to do crazy, over-the-top sort of stuff that you can only justify in a video game, which I'm kind of okay with, as as soon as I just accepted that that was going to be what was happening. Because, okay, like, sure, there's a fighter jet, that's cool. Why wouldn't they be fighting on top of a fighter jet and summoning these, like, demon dogs made out of hair, I guess, out of portals <laughs> to to kick these angels. It's fine. That was like that happened in Bayonetta 1, so that's totally expected. I just feel like on some level I need there to be some kind of consistent internal logic as to why stuff is happening. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Like, okay, so I get it. She's just summoning giant arms and legs to to punch and kick these angels out of portals from wherever. But at the end of each level, there's like some new enormous boss demon appears. And I don't know what the sort of justification is, whether these are like known demons in the Bayonetta canon or whatever, or they just thought this would be a cool idea for a video game boss. I don't know. Mm, yeah, I don't think I know either. I'm, and I, I, if you've come here seeking answers, there are none to be found. <laughs> Well, this is one of the things that made me kind of regret playing it on the easy mode, because like, I don't think it was likely that I was going to bump it back up, like bump the difficulty back up, because I was like, I found the, <laughs> the easy mode very manageable, obviously. But I thought, you know, maybe if these were supposed to be like really interesting boss fights, maybe I'm just not able to appreciate them on the easy difficulty, because it does not matter what I do to, <laughs> during this boss fight. Oh. Like, my health did not seem to go down ever. <laughs> so, it, like, I mean, I was dodging all over the place. So that was fun. Yeah, but that was cool. Yeah, yeah, it looked great. But I was like, I really don't feel any sort of need to, like, observe what the boss is doing, other than, like, oh, here comes an attack. I should probably just start mashing the dodge button, because then it'll, it'll go into bullet time. It'll, things will be great. Yeah. But I could see, you know, playing this on a higher difficulty, you maybe really have to keep up with what's going on and sort of anticipate and strategize around what's happening. So it's fun. This is the first time it occurred to me that somebody, like the appeal of Bayonetta for someone could be that the the fight, the combat is super technical and, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. kind of obtuse and requires you to like be kind of methodical. I guess maybe in the same way as a Souls-like kind of game where you have to you know, all of your moves have to be very sort of thought out and timed perfectly. And it's absolutely not the way that I consume Bayonetta. So Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, it never occurred to me for a moment that there was at the other (laughs) end of the spectrum, there was someone who had appreciated it because it was difficult. Yeah. Well, I mean, those are the guys who play it on, you know, ultra hard and and go for the the perfect ranking. Is that everything? (laughs) Uh, It's funny because I, it reminds me a lot of when I played, um, was it Hyrule Warriors, was the Zelda Musou game? Yeah. Because I've always looked at those games and been like, okay, well, this just looks like the lowest common denominator. Like, you're just mashing buttons mindlessly. There are hundreds of enemies on the screen. What can it possibly matter which buttons you press? 
Uh, and then I played that Zelda one, and I thought I, I realized like, oh, it kind of does make a difference which combos you use because each one is slightly different. Like, there's a little bit more nuance there than I expected. So I thought, well, okay, is the same thing true for Bayonetta then? And playing on easy mode, I think the answer is no. It still doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> but I could see like, okay, if this was much much harder. Maybe it does matter if you push like push X twice and then Y, or just Y three times. Maybe those pull out completely different moves that uh, have a completely different sort of tactical application. But uh, you know, playing it on easy, it's just, it's more or less just a light show. Oh yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's bombast. It looks cool. Um, yeah, and you get fireworks and a, a different move set and stuff like that, and. For me, most of these sort of combo-driven games usually just boil down to, like, two or three, like, combinations of button presses that I can remember. Mm -hmm. um, and I just use them over and over, and over again. So uh, every now and then I'll accidentally trigger, like, some move. And I'm like, how did I do that? I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> um, yeah. And the fun thing, I, I don't know if this exists in Bayonetta 2, but I remember in Bayonetta 1, like, your pause screens and your load screens were basically you kind of in an empty arena with, like, dying oh, yeah. enemies. Okay. Yeah. And you can kind of good. practice your moves, right? Um, yeah. I like that. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Strangely enough, I mean, this is another Platinum game, but it reminded me a lot of um, Near Automata. And I think, so that, it was, it was um, Bayonetta 1 came out, and then... I think this actually came out before Nier, which is weird. But I played that one before this, and I found the combat to also be just kind of, like, didn't really matter what you did, as long as you hit the dodge button in time. Right. Um, and you still, like, in that game, you had all these different weapons, you had all these different combos. And to me, and this was on normal, because those weren't really, like, that game wasn't designed to just be the insane sort of, like, technically demanding action game that, uh, like, Bayonetta and Devil May Cry are. So I would just use whatever combos felt the best and hit that dodge button, and it was fine. And that's sort of what it felt like playing this game on easy, where I would just be careful about dodging enough, and then you could just sort of like take your time with it the rest of it, <laughs> and uh, you know just kind of mash buttons thoughtlessly. Which is weird because that's not always necessarily what I want out of a video game. I kind of like to you know have some strategy to it, but. Occasionally, I the mood does come around where I just want to play some like incredibly stupid action game. Yeah, and I guess this just fell into that category. Yeah, I'm not trying to demean Bayonetta by saying it is a stupid game, but the way I play it is very stupid. <laughs> yeah, but it's cool that it sort of like works for different people at different sort of ends of the spectrum, and presumably the people in between, because I, like that's my take on like. The what was the DL, Devil May Cry Four is the DMC one is the kind of the oh, noisy wait, one. So you're talking about the Ninja Theory one, yes? Because there was a Devil May Cry Four. Okay, I'm talking about the the one with uh, edgy Dante. Yes, DMC the that had the Copy Christ soundtrack and stuff like that. Yeah, um, like that's just like I don't know. That's like uh, um, uh, empty calories. It's just like. Super yeah, consumable. Yeah, that, that's a good way of describing yeah, it. Yeah, super like super fast paced, super playable. Doesn't put up too much of a fight, particularly if you play it on easy. And it just goes. It just you know it just runs fast and and does stupid shit. And it's you like you know like those Musu games. Probably you just vanquish like waves of enemies and move on to the next one and do some cool flourishy moves yeah. and the few combos that I can remember. And and yeah, I don't remember there being like a lot of like stop screens or any reason that sort of like interrupted the action it just it was just consumable uh and uh but it's empty calories like it doesn't add up to anything mm -hmm. but it, it can be that if you want to play it that way on a difficult on a more difficult <laughs> stretch so yeah i you know i appreciate that i it's um it has to be a, a challenge to make a game that can be played by different kinds of people at different ends of sort of the difficulty spectrum um most developers know that their game is not going to get finished by people so um so why not make it as sort of fun and consumable as you can for the short time they're going to spend with it so yeah for, for me bayonetta and, and devil may cry sort of serve that purpose okay yeah it's got me kind of thinking actually like maybe it's worth going back and playing all those devil may cry games like this because the few times I ran into those, I would try and play it like, you know, on normal difficulty and just try and be one of those action gamers. 
and uh, didn't really care for it. So maybe I was missing the point. Although, yeah. I, what does that leave me, though, with this? <laughs> Just like a little bit of button mashing for 10 hours or so and a ridiculous storyline right. which as much as i tried to just play along with it and be like oh yeah well, you know the angels and, and witches and stuff i i don't think you know I, i'm not you know lining up to pre-order bayonetta 3 at this point so i can find out what happens right but you know if if you're into it then that's cool i guess yeah don't want to take bayonetta away from anyone no no absolutely <laughs> yeah i'm happy she's out there oh man yeah uh, I never found so th- uh, this was something that I thought was part of this game, but there was like a one button mode where you would just it would basically just you mash this one button over and she'd do these crazy combos. I don't know if I found that there was this one mode uh, there was like an accessory you could equip that made it sound like she would do auto combos, but it never quite became like the one button experience I was envisioning. No, oh. so I'm not sure what the deal was with that. That sounds familiar. That that might exist in Bayonetta 1. I'm not sure if it yeah. hmm. Hmm. has become a series staple. Yeah, well... So anyway, I think I still don't <laughs> quite fully understand um, Bayonetta, but I didn't have a much better time with 2 than I did with the first one. Just I think I went in with this altered mindset. So that was good. That helps. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good. So what is up next for uh, you, DJ? What are you thinking of uh, tearing into next? Uh, I think next is going to be Lunar Nights on the DS, yeah. the uh, the fourth game in the Boktai series. I was reading a little bit about the history of this. So I think, I thought Hideo Kojima was involved with this, like he directed it or wrote it or something. But I think it was just like um, developed under Kojima Productions, so he was probably the producer or something. Yeah. I don't know if this is as much of his child as like Metal Gear Solid or Death Stranding, or whatever. Sure. But um, I'll be find out, <laughs> or get a better sense of that once I get into it. So yeah. uh, I'll be playing that for next week. So if my theme for the Backlog Attack this summer is, games used to be hard, yours <laughs> is, games are so absurd and make no sense. Yeah, well, I mean, who knows? <laughs> if he didn't write this one, maybe it's like a masterpiece. Sure, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's coherent. Yeah. <laughs> it sets a high bar. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, cool. That's I mean, interesting. Um, let's wrap this thing up. If you need any more video game hangover in your brain, you should definitely follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash VGHangover. And you can always get show notes and links and tell us what you thought about this episode at VGHangover.com. Uh, we would love for you to hang out with us on Discord, chat about video games, uh, update us on your backlog attack, any number of fun things. You can get a link to that at VGHangover.com as well. Um, and we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and review us on your Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music, Machine of Choice. Um, uh, help us out by telling your friends about the show. That's uh, probably where we get the most bang for our buck on that. Yeah, really appreciate it. Word of mouth helps us out quite a bit. Um, we want to give thanks again to Saria Lemus this week for our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of her work, please go to pettypanol.bandcamp.com. You can get a link for that at vghangover.com as well. While you're there, you can listen to her entire discography and maybe buy an album or two. That would be awesome. Awesome. We'll be back next week uh, with some more Backlog Attack. Until then, this is Randy Dickinson. This is DJ Ross. Thanks for listening to Video Game Hangover. Goodbye. Good night. See you.